Well, you know, Ed and I have only been together at the Institute for a little over 34 years. A mere, you know, uh, flash of time. I first met Ed Berger <laughs> in, uh, I believe it was 1976. I think I was a senior. I think I was a senior in college, though. Uh, at Rutgers Newark, uh, Newark College of Arts and Sciences, it was officially called. And um, I was working at the Institute of Jazz Studies as a um, work study student. <laughs> well, actually, Ed preceded me by about six months, so he was already ensconced when I arrived. And he was a huge, you know, a, a huge help to me. I was uh, a reformed journalist. And this is before Dan even got here. Uh, Chris White was the director then, so um, I was working under Chris White, and um, he trusted me enough to give me the keys to the place, which was pretty good. <laughs> and um, so when Ed was was hired, basically, they let Chris White go and and, and brought Ed in uh, to keep the place open a couple of days a week um, until they could get another director. And um, so Ed came in, and I and I had to turn over my keys to him. So. That's the first thing I did, and um, that's how I got to meet him. And then Vincent Pelote, as Ed always called him. He calls me Pelote. He never calls me Vincent. I mean, I don't think he's ever called me Vincent as long as I've known him. He calls me Pelote, and, uh, which is my last name. And uh, for some reason, he thought it was so funny when somebody, I don't even remember who it was, referred to me as Pelote and my younger brother, Andre, he referred to him as the co-pilot. And so Ed just thought this was the funniest thing in the world. Pilot, the co-pilot, ha ha ha. Pilot was the uh, music student and the music department was adjacent to our quarters at Bradley Hall. And uh, he had been volunteering to help out at the Institute. So uh, he was part of the trio from an early, he made the duo into a trio, and uh, I usually refer to the three of us as the ancient jazz trio, as distinguished from the modern jazz quartet, which we uh, outlived by uh, some considerable, we outlived them by 10 years, which is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, he's the first to to break up the, uh, the, the trio, because <laughs> Dan did come in shortly after, and um, I came in again. I left the student teach uh, and then to do my substitute teaching, and then I came back again on, a, on an NEH grant to uh, catalog sound recordings, and um, I've been here ever since, and there you go. That's how the three of us sort of got together. <laughs> the first Three or four words he said to me were probably the most funniest things I've ever heard. <laughs> I can't recall those words now. I probably would not be able to repeat them in front of all these people. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of call him the Jerry Seinfeld of the Institute. So he's Bizarro Jerry. <laughs> Well, it was Lynn Mullins, a uh, former director of Daniel Library, who, who swore that, that it was the funniest guy in the world. <laughs> um, I didn't quite see it. Ed, you didn't talk to me for like the first two years that I worked here. That's the kind of thing I think I'm going to miss the most about him. <laughs> but he had his moments. Uh, one of the things I remember that he, he was so fond of relating uh, to other people is, is um, an incident where I lent him an LP, a rather rare LP by Benny Carter that I happened to have a copy of. I was reluctant to lend it to him because I don't, I don't like lending my LPs or to anybody because you know I'm one of those typical collectors who uh, you know treats their LPs like like they're the children. You know, I'm very, I'm very uh, you know protective of them. And so I, I said, you know, don't, don't damage this. I'll lend it to you, but make sure I get it back in one piece without any scratches and stuff. And so what he did was he, he, gave, he gave it back to me and um, the LP dropped out of the uh, sleeve and was rolling across the floor. And then he went to retrieve it and, he, and I think he stepped on it. 
And I, of course, I'm, I'm totally appalled by it. At this point, I'm like, oh my God, he's just ruined this, <laughs> this very rare LP that I bought. <laughs> and then I found out later that what he did was he took a, a, an LP that looked like it and he stuck it in the sleeve and <laughs> that's what actually fell out of the sleeve and he actually stepped on. It wasn't the actual LP itself, but I didn't know that at the time, so I was, <laughs> I was completely ready to kill him. And <laughs> One of the things about Ed and his humor is his ability to really empathize with your plight and then make joke of it. <laughs> For the past year or so, he's been prefacing all of his comments with, well, as an angry black woman, I think this, that, or the other. <laughs> so. <laughs> One of the, you know, key things about, about Ed's career uh, in jazz also was his wonderful collaboration, relationship, personal and professional, uh, with the great Benny Carter. And uh, uh, that involved going to Japan quite a few years in a row as uh, Benny's road manager, which when he initially was asked by Benny, uh, Ed's response was, but I don't know anything about being a road manager, and Benny said, don't worry, you'll learn, and he did. Uh, there were so many other things uh, involving Benny. Uh, Ed became his record producer. Uh, he, uh, he, you know, of course, he and his father uh, were Benny's biographers. But what happened after uh, Ed's father's untimely death was that uh, Benny Carter and the Berger family decided uh, to establish the Berger Carter Fund at the Institute, which serves to support people who want to come to the Institute to do research uh, to help them with travel expenses or since quite a few of them were uh, from other countries uh, with uh, establishing some sort of residence during their stay at the Institute as visiting scholars, visiting students. So this has been a very significant addition to the Institute's uh, activities and our ability to assist people to come here and take advantage of the wonderful collection that we have. Tells his gift as a photographer, uh, which have created a wonderful record of activities and happenings uh, at the Institute, among many other things. His outside work is a great uh, portraitist of jazz musicians. Besides our love of jazz, Ed Berger and I share a love of photography. And watching Ed work tells me a lot about Ed. Uh, he doesn't shoot a lot. By that I mean he doesn't just shoot a picture after picture after picture. He waits. He gets it. What he gets is beautiful and it shows the compassion and love that he feels for his subjects, whether it is uh, jazz musicians or his nephews. And looking at Ed's pictures, you see the feeling that he has for his subjects and the love that they feel for Ed Berger. It's uh, kind of a mirror image and you don't even have to look that close. Uh, 
Um, Ed is like, uh, one thing about Ed is that uh, he is pretty much unflappable. Uh, even when something would happen that would uh, make him angry. Uh. It's good to know that I have a partner up here at the Institute of Jazz Studies who empathizes with me and understands my plight, a fellow angry black woman. Uh, he, you know, he was uh, still uh, on an even keel. What? <laughs> uh, that was, you know, also a very good, a very good aspect of his character. I, I don't see, I don't see that at all. I mean, what are you talking about? We had some great times. We had a, we had a lot of laughs, <laughs> and we had a lot of serious moments. I do know that the place will certainly be bereft of styrofoam cups and music stands. What? <laughs> there were some great times when uh, we had our parties. I mean, what are you talking about? We had some pretty hot parties. Ed, I'm so sorry you're leaving the Institute of Jazz Studies. It won't be the same without you. Quite frankly, I've had it up to here with, <laughs> with the whole thing. <laughs> but in retirement, I know you'll get a chance to do all the things that you've wanted to do for a, a while now. The main difference around here, we'll miss the sound of taps from time to time that we often hear on the trumpet. Everyone else ask Ed about that. It was a chilly winter night, and uh, all of a sudden we heard a sound. An ominous sound. Scooby Dooby Doo. What are you doing? You're killing me here. Ed. This ain't right, okay? Bye! What would have happened if we hadn't been working late? I'm, I'm going to miss him. I really am. We've been together, like I said, for a long time, for over 30 years, and, um, you know, uh, I don't want this to sound like like a waker or, or, or anything like that, because I'm still going to see the guy. I mean, I'm, we're gonna, still going to go out to concerts. We're still going to go. We're going to go do st stuff. He's going to probably come to my house, and I'm going to have dinner and stuff because my wife wants to see him. I don't know why, and, <laughs> and we're going to have a great old time. But he won't be here, you know, doing the everyday things, and uh, and that's going to be a little hard. But hey, listen, life goes on. I wish him all the best. Mazel tov, ya bum. Do the <laughs> do whatever the, the heck it is you want to do, and uh, you know all the best to you. And uh, thanks for the for the good times and and for your um, your stewardship and your advice and uh, and uh, the good humor and the good times. And um, I'm gonna remember all that. And um, hey, what can I say? Uh, life goes on. <laughs>